Hello everyone and welcome along to the Bank of Scotland Telling Your Story online session with myself Adam and Faye. Hi everyone. Hello, you may have noticed we are not Scottish ourselves but we both tried to represent by wearing a bit of blue <laughs> and white um, just to make you guys feel a bit more at home. So thank you so much for joining us. First of all, what I'm going to do is share some slides. The inevitable uh, slight issue with uh, always comes when you try and do something technical. Nick, good uh, saying hello in the chat. You've beaten me to one of my first bits of uh, the thing, which is please do get involved in the chat. Ask us questions. Say hello. Tell us where you're dialing in from. Tell us what you're hoping to get out of the session. Tell us what you've had for breakfast. <laughs> Anything that you want to get involved in, um, please use the chat to do so. If you're having any problems hearing or seeing us or with the functionality of the platform, do in the first instance try a refresh, press that little circular button on the top left hand side of your browser window. If you're still having problems, pop it in the chat and uh, one of the admins will be over quick as a flash to help you out. Good morning to you too, Lou. So welcome to the Bank of Scotland Academy. We're really excited to have you here. This is one of three different online webinars that we offer. We're the one on the far right, telling your story in an online world. But we also have one all about using digital school tools, sorry, not schools, <laughs> to lead and collaborate within your business, and then how to grow your network and your customer base um, using online and digital tools. You can find all of them by visiting our lessons at the Bank of Scotland Academy.com, that thing in the bottom right. So do have a look if you find this one interesting. If you want to find out more, do go along and have a look. So what's so important is about how we're operating. So 75% of businesses are now using fraud prevention procedures. So important. 33% of businesses are increasing turnover whilst saving time due to their digital capabilities. And I think what we think is if you can gain more skills, do stuff online, it's not just about making more money and doing loads of stuff. It's also about saving yourself time to do things that you actually enjoy, whether that's speaking to customers, speaking to clients, spending more time not on your business, those sorts of things. And um, importantly, the Bank of Scotland Academy uses a blended learning offering. So you can go online, learn at your own pace, or you can come and listen to Faye and I as we chat to you on a Friday morning, hopefully with a cup of tea. So a bit of quick fire housekeeping for you all on the call. Um, we're going to go back at some point to our tables. So when we do so, do make sure your webcam's on to get the full functionality. I said it before, but I'm very much going to say it again. Do ask questions, join discussions, use the chat. We're actually going to do a bit of a workshop for you later on in the session. So as with always with these sorts of things, do get involved. Um, there will be a bit of a Q&A. We'll hang about at the end of the session. We encourage you guys to do so as well, meet other folks and small businesses. And then finally, we're really keen to get your feedback. Did you enjoy the session? Was it rubbish? Um, <laughs> don't say is, that. Don't say <laughs> that. Is there anything you'd like to change? Is there anything you particularly enjoyed about it? So that's housekeeping out the way. Um, Nick's from Falkirk in central Scotland. Lovely. I've actually got a good friend from Falkirk in central Scotland. She always tells me that I need to go up and see the Kelpies. Do you know what they are? Not a clue. It's two big um, statues of uh, horses' heads. Mm. There you go. So, what we'll be covering today communicating, there you go, communicating effectively and succinctly online, writing and communicating in different styles and tones, understanding how to communicate with different audiences, and then, crucially, one of the most important things that we do experimenting, testing, and learning. Katrina had her breakfast on Dartmoor. That's not Scotland, Katrina. Are you on holiday or have you dialed in um, from England? You're very welcome nonetheless. It's not going to be all about Scotland, we promise. Cool. So I'll hand over to Faye, who will you, take you through the first couple of steps as to how to tell your story in an online world. But first, one thing that we want to get you to think about is some of the kind of standout brands that you kind of know and that you think of. Um, so do pop in the chat um, some kind of brands that really resonate with you. And I think we always often get John Lewis. Um, 
they kind of have a, a really clear message and quite a, a kind of core never knowingly undersold uh, great adverts around Christmas time uh, but but name some brands that that really resonate with you and just pop them in the chat on this side there we go <laughs> so one of the ones that we would have said at this point that we've been researching was actually Brewdog they previously to three days ago had a really good story that they were telling um they were always known as a craft beer brand that was sort of fighting the big boys and didn't sell out and uh has then changed all of its story to being sustainable and doing things in a really interesting sustainable way clearly they're now having to deal with a different story that's coming out about them i don't know if you've seen in the news but a bunch of their staff have come out and said the story they're telling wasn't authentic it wasn't our experience it wasn't what they were doing and i think it's a really interesting one to think about because they did have this really strong brand this really strong story they spoke in a really interesting tone of voice they you know were a little bit sweary sometimes they were a little bit cheeky they didn't play by the rules but they're now going to have to deal with this counter story that's come out ms really Good true one. i think they sort of won the storytelling wars early in the sort of 2000s with their food and that um that amazing advert those amazing adverts this isn't just for any food this m &S food <laughs> yeah yeah with that softly spoken lady james williams with apple i think apple is one of the strongest brands um there's no way i would ever give up my apple phone um it's sort of like a bit of a religion weirdly for a lot yeah. of people you know they'll camp outside they'll do that sort of stuff coca-cola um sainsbury's bash is coming with nike i think nike's got such an interesting story whether it's um the the talk of a salesman um who then turned into the the founder shoe dog or whether it's trying to break the two hour marathon record or whether it's the fact that they also do a lot of um athlete sponsoring those sorts of things um james williams <laughs> the mns caterpillar cake i think aldi came out of that story session yeah quite well, well yeah i think mns struggled a little bit um, with it because aldi again didn't play by the sort of corporate conversation storytelling rules. They were cheeky, they were funny, they were sort of taking the piss a little bit. Um, and at the end of the day, they then raised money for charity, which again meant that MS couldn't really go on the offensive against them. So it's quite an interesting one. Cool. So without further ado, um, we'll go into the rest of the session. What I want you guys to do is keep in mind, consider all of those brands that we've just spoken about and whether you think they're doing what we're talking about, if they're doing it differently, and we'll go from there. So Faye, over to you. Fabulous. So information alone is not enough. Uh, the image on the right hand side is quite clear to us, but clearly it's not resonating with its target audience, which is why it's so important to think about your audience, no matter how strong your message is, it really does need to get through. So it's really helpful to understand how people receive information, which is what we're going to think about next. But in this instance, what might have been a slightly better approach, um, a better method of communication might have been a barking dog or a scarecrow. Um, the, the sign isn't really doing it for, <laughs> for, for the seagull there. Um, but it's really something that we want to think about so you can kind of understand some best tips and best practice when thinking about who your audience is. It's also worth noting that uh, drawing was taken off of a real photo, so we've not just made that up. It does exist. <laughs> so what we want to talk to you about is the VARC learning model. This has been around for roughly as long as I have, and it groups people into four different categories. And um, that's not to say that you exclusively sit in one. Most people do sit across um, all, but you will have a dominant learning style. So I'll run through each of them, and then we're going to do a quick task to understand what everybody's learning style is on the call today. So read, write um, on the bottom left there are people who really like to kind of make notes. There'll be people who often have like a, a written list um, and kind of tick things off as they go. They enjoy reading an article or a newspaper and kind of absorbing information in the written form. Our visual learners, on the other hand, are people who just want to see a picture, they want to see a graph, they kind of are, are a bit more taken in by colour and, um, you know, they, they don't really um, kind of lean too heavily on the text. Um, those two are our most dominant styles, so what you'll find is that people tend to sit in and around those two. 
On the right hand side there, we've got auditory learners. So these people love a podcast, a seminar, a discussion. Um, they've probably excelled over the last year, sitting in Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, um, listening to conversation. Um, but they really just kind of enjoy the discussion and they'll really just take in information. You know, I think jingles are a really good example of that. There's probably adverts and songs that we can all remember the words of despite them being kind of 10, 15 years old. And then our last group are kinesthetic learners. So these people are people who really love to learn by doing. Um, they enjoy a case study. They'll want to practice it themselves. Um, they kind of just want to get out there and understand actually how it properly works in real life. So in the chat on the right hand side of your screen, uh, the Q&A tab at the top, you should see that these four options have been put in there. What I want you to do is just upvote which one you think your dominant learning style is. So how is it that you prefer to take in information? Are you a bookworm? Do you love a seminar? Do you love talks like this? Do you just want to take it away and read it? Visual, kinesthetic, lots of kinesthetic learners. No auditory. Oh. So we'll shut up and we'll just, <laughs> we'll just write what we were going to say and then you guys don't have to listen to us. So three visual, it looks like, two kinesthetic and one read, write. Interesting. Yeah, so, so why we want you to think about these is that it's very easy to fall into the trap of exclusively communicating to your audience in your own learning style. And what we can see from this is that actually there's an absolute variety of learning styles and sending out one message in one way often isn't going to land with everybody. So it's really important to think about how you can A, vary your message or tell a story um, in the same way, um, but you, you know, using a different format or how you can kind of lean into some of the other options um, just to make sure that you're making sure that you are uh, reaching a wider audience. And here's a really good example of this. So uh, selling a house, probably one of the biggest decisions that we'll all ever make, or buying, buying, a, buying, buying a house, house buying a house even, um, you will initially uh, have a look on uh, Rightmove or on the market or any other um, website, have a little look at the pictures, understand what it is um, that it looks like. Do, you like, do you like the looks of it? And then you'll read all the information about it and check through and say, okay, yeah, this looks good, uh, all happy with that. You'll then go and speak to um, an estate agent and have a bit of a conversation about what it is that you're looking for and your needs. And then you will go and view the property and see what it actually looks like in real life, if the pictures did it justice or if it's actually a little bit smaller than you thought. Um, and that's a really good example of um, a situation that requires all four different um, different learning styles. But the same can be said for your own communications, whether that's um, an email um, or a, a social media post. There are ways in which you can kind of share the same message in different formats to make sure that all of your audience can enjoy it. I think important that Katrina and Vashi have both said we use a little of all. We oh, do tend sure. to sit across all of these things but we do tend to have a predominant style. So for me, I love writing and I love reading. So for me, I'm very much read write, and that means I can fall into the trap of just sending people emails or just trying to communicate in that one comfort zone sort of uh, way of doing stuff, which actually means I need to force myself to get out and, and try the others as well. Absolutely. And here's just another example. So I guess why we wanted to show this one is that these two situ these two images both show um, the same thing, um, but the one on the right hand side, so the the moon image, uh, the, the man on the moon, even, um, it can make you feel something that the words alone cannot. And whilst um, you know most of that text on the left hand side might be uh, largely fluff somebody who enjoys a read write like adam um will definitely feel like he's taken in more information just from reading that article than he could have got from looking at the image but the image does make you kind of it, it's more emotive and it's definitely quite a, a you know standout remember memorable image so there are benefits to, to both but it's also helpful to kind of try and think about how you can land communications in a multimedia way cool so um i'm going to talk to you now about 
when we consider how we talk to our audiences, what level of detail and how we speak to them and sort of how we begin. And one of the things that I want you guys to take away as a little tip is to assume nothing. If you think about all of those brands that we spoke about earlier, whether it's Nike, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Aldi, they tend to tell you who they are as the first thing that they do. So on screen is my mate's cat. Now, if I was to ask all of you guys, why is she called what she's called? It's a bit of a silly question, mostly because very likely you don't know my mate. And even if you do, you might not have asked the reason why she's called her cat, what it's called. And this is actually something we do quite, quite commonly. And we assume a base level of knowledge when we tell a story or when we communicate externally or with folks that don't know stuff like we do. And actually, if you see big businesses and big brands and really good storytellers, they always assume nothing or they assume that the audience they're speaking to knows nothing. And what this does is it brings us along on the journey with them from the start. So if you think about a John Lewis Christmas advert, they literally tell you like they are selling goods that you can give to your family that will make them happy, it tends to sort of be the, the gist of all of their uh, Christmas adverts. And they don't assume that you even know sort of who they are. And what we tend to do as communicators and storytellers, if we go into a presentation or we speak to a funder or we're trying to sell a product, is because we know a lot about it, we often assume that other folks do as well. And it's a really easy and simple and quick way to turn folks off of our story or our message right at the start. People, humans instinctively struggle to say, oh, sorry, I don't know what you mean. Can you start from the start? But actually people are really comfortable in saying, oh, I knew all of that, catch me up and let's move on to a little more detail. So the first sort of tip and trick for you guys is start from the start and assume that your audience, the people you're speaking to, the people you're telling your story to, assume nothing in terms of base level of knowledge from them. For the record, the cat is called Zephyr and um, I think she was named after a red hot Chili Peppers song. Now, here's something that we often get told or I often get told because I love to write, is this four letter acronym here, TLDR. Uh, it's a bit of an editor's thing. Spoiler alert, we're gonna hear a lot about newspaper editors because they tell very good stories and very commercial stories as well. And this means too long, didn't read. If you're considering who your audience is, think about the level of information that you want to give them and think about if you've got a 30 second advert, a podcast, and information that you're giving, think about that TLDR. You never wanna receive this back. It was too long, it turned me off, I simply didn't read it. So back to our newspapers. Here we've got um, a chap uh, who's struggling a little bit with the folds of his newspaper. <laughs> and the reason why I say this is, um, editors back in the day, and I guess still now, who knows if newspapers um, what they're talking about these days, now we've got the internet, they used to have something called being above the fold. And simply, it means um, back in the day, when you wanted to sell newspapers, what you would have is the most interesting, the most attention grabbing part of your story above the fold of the newspaper. The simple reason was this, uh, why this was, was because newspaper boy, I sort of envisioning like 1920s New York here, like read all about it. Like that's the way you grabbed people in. You'd look, you'd have one glance at that newspaper above the fold and that would be your decision then. Will I buy it because it's interesting to me or will I not? Likewise, a stack of newspapers sitting in a shop, you're looking at it while you're buying your cigarettes, please don't smoke or sweets or lottery ticket or whatever it is. That's where you decide there and then, am I gonna buy it because of the headline that's there? So this is again, something that we tend to struggle with as sort of humans when we communicate. We tend not to think about how do we get people's attention with this story? How do we put all of the information that people are going to need to want to make a decision on whether to engage with it above the fold? Now, clearly none of us are newspaper editors, you might be, but I doubt it. Above the fold actually is really relevant even today. So what above the fold means is the subject line of your email heading are you grabbing people in? Are you getting their attention there? What it means if you're doing online advertising is are you more than a scroll away on your thumb? Are you gonna press that skip button on your five seconds of YouTube video advertising? All of these things are grabbing people's attention above the fold. And I think it's really important for us to consider how we can grab people's attention 
before our sort of three, four, five second attention span, I think it is these days, has moved on to the next thing, the next swipe, the next Instagram story, whatever it might be. So we've got um, some examples here of what it is. So 10 to 20% of people tend to not go into the details of what we've got. So if you look inside that little box, you've got a very, very detailed um, newspaper headline, again, from the 1920s, very uninteresting, looks dense, looks difficult to get through. Very dense. Very dense. Because <laughs> on the right, I would say that the uh, the um, advertisements, advertisements yeah. I can't speak to that, I don't know why, <laughs> are a little bit more simple. They've got pictures, they're a little bit more accessible. They're sort of drawing you in um, above the fold there. So one of the things that I encourage folks to be is to be a newspaper and not a mystery novel. What I mean by that is murder mysteries are who done it. They say the big reveal until the last page sometimes and you think, oh, I don't know what's going on. Whereas newspapers tell you what you need to know right in that top line heading. And that is really important when you tell stories. If you think about if you're trying to do a presentation, if you're trying to tell a story over a podcast, if you're trying to do an advertisement, think about giving that level of information, the key reveal, the murder, the who done it, right at the start as your headline, and not at the end in a paragraph that someone might not read or that might um, have left you. So how I like to think about this is in this other journalist trick here, it's called the inverted pyramid. And basically as the pyramid gets thinner towards the bottom, that's less and less people that have read through to the bottom or listened to the end or um, looked closely or whatever you've produced. How I think about this, weirdly, is a game of Cluedo that I've played the night before and then a conversation I had the next day with my mum who asked me about it. So she says, what did you do last night? I said, I played Cluedo. She says, who won? That's sort of her top line, need to know metric. Clearly, it was me. <laughs> I won the game of Cluedo. Underneath that relevant supporting detail, she might be interested to know that it was Colonel Mustard in the conservatory with the lead piping. I very much doubt she's interested in some of that nice to know detail that sits underneath, which is what color socks I was wearing at the time, individual die rolls, which rooms everyone went in, where we were sitting around the table, what we drank while we were playing, those sorts of things. If you think about your mum or my mum as your sort of general audience, they tend to fit into this inverse pyramid. They want to know, they need to know that detail at the top. They might be interested in the relevant supporting detail underneath, and then they might, but probably won't be interested in some of that nice to know detail that sits underneath that. So when you're telling your story, think about that inverse pyramid that sits underneath it. Now, sometimes I do get asked at this point of the presentation, what about if people need detail? What about if you're doing something technical? Absolutely, 100%. So what I've got in front of you here on the slide is very confusing and quite hard to read and uses a lot of acronyms and would probably receive that acronym from me, TLDR. Essentially what it is saying is it's talking about microchips that sit within televisions. Televisions these days are smart, they've got Bluetooth, they can connect to the internet. Um, and as you need smarter televisions, you need smarter chips to power them. It's quite simple, but what you've got here is a lot of technical detail about said chips, their processing capability, their ability to work with 4K content, graphics, capitalizations, there's a lot of nonsense there that I don't understand. Now, I've talked a lot about detail and who needs it. This is all about considering the audience and what level of detail they need. So I'd argue that this slide here, this picture, would be useful for someone who's an engineer of microchips or televisions. They'll understand it. They might find it useful for a piece of work they're working on. They might then think, OK, based on what I've got here, I need to make amends, yada, yada, yada. This would not be useful for someone who's buying a television. Really boring. And likewise, even within the same company as the engineers, this is probably not useful to a television salesman. So one of the sort of key things that I want you guys to think about is what level of detail you're giving and to who. Now on screen there, you've got a said smart television. This actual, just this photo might be more useful for a salesperson to say, look at all the apps, look at the different stuff you can download. As TVs get smarter, they connect to different boxes, to different dongles, 
they need faster processing capability, they need to be able to connect to the internet quicker, and essentially, we need to produce better chips to do so. So by no means are Faye and I saying, don't use any level of detail. What we are saying is really, really consider your audience and then consider what level of detail they need before you give it to them. So different audiences, different requirements. It's pretty straightforward, but a lot of what Faye and I talk through, we do subconsciously, but what we tend not to do when we tell stories and speak is make these things conscious. So I spoke about the level of detail I'd give my mum over Cluedo. That's something I would probably do subconsciously. Um, but when we're writing communications, when we're talking to people, when we're presenting, it's really important to try and bring that to the conscious, to the fore, and think about who am I presenting to, what's my audience, and what's my different requirements. So on the left and the right, we've got two different audiences. The left is not me at work, and to be fair, that isn't what my work looks like, but that's my internal colleague group that I speak to, and I speak to internal colleagues, you might be surprised to know, very differently to how Faye and I are speaking to you on this call today. And that is on the right-hand side, us presenting to a group of people. So we've got two different groups there, and the reason that we do that is because it's a really oversimplified version of what I think is a really useful exercise for folks to do, which is to understand who the different audiences are, on the left internal, on the right external. I know externally, Faye and I, if we're speaking to you guys, have to try and be quite engaging. Hopefully. Hopefully, <laughs> have to try and be a little bit interesting, have to try and impart some knowledge, um, take questions, engage you guys. Internally, clearly, um, we work for Bank of Scotland, so it's all about um, giving people the information they need, working with our teams to try and make sure that we're um, being constructive, taking on feedback, trying to do the roles to the best of our abilities. Clearly, Faye and I don't speak to our bosses or our directors in the same way that we speak to you, but that's no bad thing. It's all about giving your audiences the different requirements that they need. So as you guys tell stories, whether it's a new website, whether it's a blog, think about who your audience is and what the requirements are. And then based on all the slides that we've had so far, the seagull on the thing, what sort of story should we tell, the VUT learning model, how should we tell it? Think about the level of detail that we need, the level of knowledge that you guys are assuming. What, where do they sit within these different audience groups? 100%. And for people, you know, if in your organization you work closely with others, it can be really helpful to do um, the, the colors test. So if you have done it, pop it in the chat, let us know what color you are. Uh, red, green, blue, or yellow. Um, unsurprisingly, Adam and I are yellow, um, enthusiastic people who love to get involved. Um, we often kind of think of our senior leaders and, and our executives as red, and those people are, um, you know, slightly more, they just want the high level summary, um, don't give them too much information, be bright, be brief, and be gone. Um, for people who are slightly more analytical and pragmatic in focus, they really want the details, they'll be blue. And um, lots, of, um, you know, if, if you're slightly leaning more towards kind of the caring and pathetic side of, of things, then you'll be green. So in a small team, it's really helpful to understand, um, you know, kind of who who is what. So I would definitely recommend having a, having a little go. I can see Barshi's yellow. Uh, so another enthusiastic, um, get me involved person. But um, yeah, when you work in a team, it can be really helpful to understand, um, you know, what your, what your team is like, Katrina's a green, so definitely thinking about how you approach people with different, um, di based on their different colors, is a really great way for that internal audience to kind of think about what their requirements might be. You know, is it that you just need to send them three bullet points, or do you need to send them all of the information in an Excel spreadsheet so that they can dive into that data themselves if they're blue? Um, so we'll pop in a link to, um, I should, this way, uh, we'll pop in a link to, um, to that um, test so that if you haven't done it, you can have a little go. But again, as we always say with all of these things, um, it, it's very difficult to know what your audience is if you're communicating to a larger audience, if you're sending out a newsletter, for example, um, you know, you can never really be too sure what that audience looks like. But if you do work closely with a key kind of set of stakeholders in your network, then really, really great to kind of try and understand or to guess which one they might be. 
that's one I've literally just Googled right now. But there's loads out there. There's Myers Briggs, there's um, different ones. But the one that Faye and I like is that four colors because it does help us when we understand who we're speaking to, how they want to be engaged, and the sort of level of detail that they need. So a nice little tip and trick for you guys to take away there. Cool, so they say there's no such thing as a free lunch, and this is very, very true. <laughs> so we've got a little bit of a workshop and something that we're quite keen for you guys to take away and do. We think as there's six people on the call, we can do this on one, one table, table today. So what we're going to do is Faye and I are going to pop a link into the chat on the right hand side and all of you guys to gather around one table. And what the easy way to do that is just double click. Everyone move. I think the, when we joined table two was the busiest. Yes, yeah, the popular table. The popular, <laughs> the cool tables because I wasn't on it. So click <laughs> over onto table two, double click onto there and then we'll chat through this. So. So whilst Adam finds the um, the article that we're going to um, talk you through, I will um, explain what 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 it is that we want you to do on on your table. So we want you to um, take a look at the article. So we will link that in the chat when the time is right. Um, take a look at the article, give it a quick read. Um, it won't be too long, but um, give it a really quick read, and then. Um, have somebody on your table be the scribe. We want you to edit the information that's in the article down into a single paragraph. We also want you to uh, capture it in three bullet points, um, summarize it in a headline, and then sensationalize a headline for clickbait, which is our absolute favorite part. So we really look forward to seeing those. Um, the purpose of this exercise is for you to kind of read a full article and then just draw out the absolute key points. Adam and I have not read this article, um, so we are very much looking forward to seeing your summaries because we're going to hope that you're going to give us the information that we need. So um, edit down to a single paragraph, rewrite to capture it in three bullet points, summarize it in a headline, and then uh, the best one, sensationalize it for a Daily Mail style clickbait Twitter headline. But like really sensationalize it. Like yeah. you need all the clicks for this. <laughs> so like, yeah, just go really big on the sensational stuff. Amazing. And then um, before we before we break out into the tables, we've popped just a couple of reminders of what we've talked through today. So remember people do have different learning styles. So a bit of homework that we always say um, that people should take away is thinking about um, what once you've kind of broken the information down from the article, how might you present that in different formats for the different learning styles? Um, consider the level of detail. This uh, exercise is really going to make you do that because we are quite strict on our uh, on what we're allowing you to um, present back. Assume no knowledge. As we said, we do not know these articles. <laughs> um, avoid acronyms and keep it concise and structure your message so that it flows um, in, a, in a good way. Um, what we'll do, we'll break out um, and then we will get, set a timer across the top of the screen so that you'll have um, about 10 minutes to run through the exercise and then we'll regroup back into stage mode where we will um, look forward to seeing, um, seeing your responses in the chat. Do if you can, try and make sure your camera and mic is on to engage in the participation and without further ado, we'll send you back. So all gather around one table and away you go, enjoy. <laughs>